Go into your arm. Four years ago, both the college began creating online materials that function as a complete free textbook for courses in Italian language and culture. We offer these materials in a range of courses in these three rather different contexts and formats. Now, to produce all of this, it's a real dino. I'm not that dino. Daniela Barlazy Brock is the person who conceived of these projects, um, created virtually all the content, designed the pedagogy, and teaches the courses as well. She also is continuing to revise and innovate these as we go along. Uh, but Daniela is giving a talk in Spain on this topic, so I've been deputized to present her work today. The summer of 2014, we began by creating a uh, Seven week online course. It was open to Wellesley alumna and the incoming students. So these are the first year students in the summer just before they arrive on campus. They have no experience with Wellesley. And I'd like to ask you to speculate on what percentage of the incoming class chose to enroll in the summer online Italian course. So raise your hands. You can confer the right number. The three choices are 2%. 9% or 18%. So we'll start with the big one. Raise your hand if you think 18% of the students. Okay. All right. In bold. All right. How about 9%? This is going to be a number, but no. 2%? Okay. Well, the 18s are right. Imagine that. 18% of your incoming class enrolls in a seven week online course in town. So the first summer we did it, summer 2014 and summer 2015, those two <coughs> average out to 18% of the class. So both summers were very consistent. We don't know what happened in 2016. That's only 10%. But still, 10%. So that suggests a couple of things. One is there's some sort of abiding interest in Italian. Mm -hmm. um, there's also, I think, a desire of the students to connect to the campus somehow before they come to to Wales. Um, and moreover to have an experience in the academic program. There's lots of ways they can connect admissions to all kinds of stuff. Maybe some of the college institutions as well. But they wanted to dive in and actually do some learning. That very fall in 2014, we offered the first blended version of this course. So it's essentially <coughs> the same content we used in the summer. It's now part of a face-to-face -face course. This is an introductory Italian class. And I'd like to ask you again to guess about enrollments. This time, I want you to guess whether enrollment for this introductory Italian course that is now going to for the first time increased, decreased, or stayed the same. This time, I want you to raise fingers. So, uno finger, if you think it stayed the same, didn't really make much difference. Two A fingers, if you think enrollment decreased. Maybe we sucked off all the interest in that summer course, people are not going to bother. Today, fingers, if you think it increased. Well, the, the trays have it, it did indeed increase. So, despite the summer course, we had more students taking introductory Italian than ever before because it was a blended course. Now, one of the reasons it's, uh, I was attracted to them is that first item on the slide the introductory course was five days long. There are a couple other language courses that were within five days long, and one or two others, but everything else is three, two, or one class. So this was sort of a structural thing that made a big difference to enable students to just plain participate. There's another reason, we know this by surveying the students, that they uh, chose to take it. What might that be? Something else about learning that made it more appealing. First group is on the slide. Yeah. Was it so they were at home when it was the, the online component? No. Okay. Well, they could be anywhere they want. Okay. Yeah. So maybe they were still working or something like that. I'm sorry, we're talking about the fall course during the regular Oh, it's like in the fall. Course. So the other item's on the, the slide there, but it's hidden. Is it that they could practice on their own? That was a useful component, but in terms of just getting into the class, mm -hmm. Previously to study Italian at the introductory level, you had to spend several hundred dollars on a textbook and a workbook. Ah, yes. That 
The yes. online part is the entire textbook and a whole lot more than you ever got in the printed manuals. If I can say that publicly. Um, so these are two things that enable students to participate. They may have been desired previously, but just couldn't fit into their schedule. Or cost is still an issue, even though they believe with a large college like ours. Um, so that uh, is a major factor. Another thing that happened is previously in introductory Italian classes, less than a third of the students were first years. Two thirds of them, more than two thirds, were upperclassmen. The very first time we taught this class, and again, everyone since we've done five semesters since, um, now three quarters of the students are first years, which is a remarkable difference and suggests that they're able to commit to it earlier in their programs, gives them much more flexibility later on, or even to stop taking the time and do something else. But at least they're confident or comfortable beginning the journey there. That's all good getting them in the room, so to speak, or online. But what we really care about is did they learn it? In our case, we would learn at least as much as in face-to-face class. Student understanding of their own learning is famously suspect. But you do need to ask the question and then leaven that with some other analysis or, or interpretation if possible. So here's what the students thought. The green bars show that they learned significantly more in the blended class than in any other language class experience they had. Now we asked them some questions like what was that? But at least in general, they felt at least it's doing the red bars or better. There are blue bars at the bottom, though, saying that it wasn't a useful to them. So we've taken some steps to try and discover what that is and ameliorate them. I can talk about that later in the question <coughs> In a minute, I'm going to ask you to use a digital device. So take a second, pull out your phone. The phone is perfectly good. If you have a computer, you need to get on the, the network. If you would, go ahead and grab that while I keep talking. So that's the student perspective, that they learned at least as well. From our perspective, we wanted to understand what is really going on in the class from an instructional standpoint. So we uh, interviewed instructors. We have done uh, pre and post surveys of the students as well as instructor experience for each class. We uh, have videotaped entire class sessions and then discourse analysis by coding what's happening and all the interactions. Who spoke first, how long, was it a statement or an interrogative, what vocabulary did they use, and grammar construction, was it corrected or not, if it was a mistake. It was a huge amount of work to try and understand what's actually happening in the class. One thing we can assert is the students are writing more than they ever have. This is facilitated by them doing the writing in a discussion form. Now, you can import that into any class. It doesn't have to be a part of a learning thing, you can do that in any Fashion. And the discussion forms mean that the instructor gives an assignment, posts a question, they write a paragraph as a reply. The instructor replies to that, making suggestions for corrections or improvements to the writing. The students write a second time, and then the instructor grades that. This all happens within about a 24 hour cycle. It's very easy to jump in, quickly do it. But this has made the students able and willing to write much more. We know that writing practice is highly correlated with success in language learning. The students like it. The instructor finds it easy. to of just passing the files or sharing the Google Doc stuff. Um, not only that, the instructor reports it's higher quality writing. Earlier in the course, they're getting the facility in the language. So that's a pretty exciting development. The instructors also report that the conversation level in the class it was more like a second or third semester course. Uh, not at the beginning of the course, but uh, halfway through, they, they arise that level of confidence and agility that usually takes them longer to achieve. And again, we can talk about why, but I don't want to go into some other things. We've also had outside uh, observers, and they report some more sense. And it's been really great in the course. We've been running blended courses for a couple of years. A year and a half ago, we took, again, the same content, but we had a different format, which was divided up into three segments for uh, MOOCs, when we had X platform. We ran in the self-paced courses for an entire year. This obviously expanded our reach enormously, right? Uh, which is one of uh, Danielle's goals, is to try and disperse the time and make the courses as far as she can. Uh, this also allows us to do research at scale. 
both in terms of the numbers and the broads are diversity. Well, so you can say we have 18 to 22 year old women. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But by broadening the students, hopefully you can learn something more about is what you're uh, producing for the for the local students who also work in Atlanta or vice versa. Now, uh, we've taken our studies of what's happening with the MOOCs, the info surveys and some other instruments we've employed there, and compared it to what's happening in the blended courses to highlight some of the things that they inform each other. So you got your device, phone or computer, please go to minta.com, put in that six digit code, 369582. And I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. Here it is, repeat it again. And thinking about these types of content or activities or tools that you might find online, either blended or MOOC, I'd like you to make some choices as to what you think the students value most. Do you think discussion storm forums are a waste of time from a student perspective? Or is it low? Do you think they're higher? Just take a second. I'll give you 20 seconds or so. Just some guesses. What's your, this was the MOOC or the blended or both? It's the same content, so used in both contexts. If you just imagine like that all were surveyed, everyone surveyed, what did they think? Could you please show us the code again? It's at the top there. Oh, thank you. 369582. This is the primary reason why people put an empty over poll anywhere, or everywhere that you heard this, because it shows me. Well, everywhere you have to go back to the previous Is that good? There we go. Alright, give me a couple more seconds, but it looks like you're thinking discussion forums are pretty useful. It's like grammar charts are really low and some of this other stuff. Alright, got a rough sense of your perspective? Alright, let's see what the students actually say. I want to point out a couple of things here. Grammar charts and exercises, both graded and ungraded, are the things that students in both the blended course and the MOOCs rated most highly. Blue is blended, these other three are the three variants of the MOOCs, but they basically travel together, so think this is unitary, so blended or <coughs> So what strikes you about grammar charts and exercises? How would you describe those as learning tools or activities? Assessment, practicing, getting feedback. Okay. Um, I'm assuming the grammar charts probably help with that because you have a reference. Okay. Any of you studied a language, you remember looking at something that said, This is how you do a verb declension in the line. That's what a grammar chart is. Yeah. It is really old fashioned, the most boring, structured, fact only way to understand the structure of workings of the language. But they rated it the most highly. This was very surprising to us because there are other ways to learn grammar. And in fact, in our courses, we explicitly tell the students, you can learn everything you need to know without ever looking at the grammar charts. We have a multiplicity of ways for them to learn it. The videos cover it. There are podcasts, audio files they can listen to. We have text and, and context with little call-outs that explain the grammar working within a sentence. You can uh, do uh, other activities to cover it. And yet the students value and rank them most highly. So the main takeaway from this <coughs> is don't discount this. We talked to other people who've done other MOOCs and other courses who feel like, yeah, we've got all this multimedia stuff, we can ditch the grammar charts and leave them behind. In fact, we even sell a printed packet of them if the students will want it, mm -hmm. and they buy that. They can print them out themselves, they can download the PDFs, but they want to have that thing. So they're highly attached to that. That may be familiarity. If you took a language class, you probably kind of grammar charts. Of course, you did testing and things to evaluate your progress. But that's something that really surprised us, especially in the language course, and all the other options. The discussion forums, that was a thing you uh, rated quite highly. Um, they suddenly rated pretty high in the MOOCs. There's not a lot going on there. These are self-paced courses, there's no instructor, the students are left to their own devices, they are told to go in 
introduce yourself, ask questions of each other, there are little assignments they can do, but there's no way to evaluate or grade them. It's still they rate it pretty highly. The blended course, they do that writing exercise I talked about. So they are graded on that. So I think that's one reason they rate it highly. They also recognize that it works very well. They like getting that uh, writing practice um, and feel that it's worthwhile. I think that partly explains the disparity there. The other thing I want to point out is this one. What we call the chalk videos on the Hindu folders, right? The situation conversational videos. We work really hard on those to create high quality videos that were not the scenic, run type crap that you get elsewhere. And so the things like doing your laundry at the laundromat, you're exercising at the park, and the, the grammar and the cultural stuff is really closely tied to the lesson. And we focus group tested them and everything. And people generally like them and find them very valuable. In the MOOC, that's really their only way to experience this, right? We have interviews with people who've been in commercial films they can watch and TV shows and stuff like that. But still, this is where it's closely tied to the, the unit or the content that they're learning. Interestingly, we knew in the blended courses for years that they weren't watching very many of them. And we'd ask them questions in surveys and never gave us very good answers. But when we did the MOOC and, and compared the results here and then did some cross question, we finally understood that for the students in the blended course, they were finding them just a little too difficult. <coughs> You've got to have material be more challenging than where the students are, right? There's any room for learning. Mm -hmm. But what turns out, we pitch them a little too high. In the most, they just wrestle with them because they have no other choice. In the face-to-face -face class, in the blended course, they could get away without using them by coming to class and asking Questions. But it took us a while to sort that out. And so we're now recasting some of those videos and getting them to better fit to their um, abilities at this time. That is a really good taste of some things we've done the last couple of years. I hope I plan a couple of seeds for you. But I and the other people on this team, Danielle and Laura Brown, who helped put all this together, would love to talk to you. So please contact us. Questions about any details, of course, the question and answer out there tomorrow can be tough. But we would love to learn more about what we did if it's of use to you. We'd also like to learn what you may be doing or wanting to do. And uh, we'd be delighted to collaborate. Whether it's around the time of, we've done almost 10 other books and 15 other learning courses. But one of the things that we're sort of seeing here is the fact that we can reuse this content in these very different contexts also suggests. We can do this with offering courses at your institution. If you don't have a piece of Portuguese, we can offer Portuguese class to your students, not necessarily an open book, but a limited enrollment thing, or teach joint courses, or if you're into Italian, let's not reinvent the wheel. Maybe you have a great unit on soccer or something, and a gerund. We'll stick that <laughs> in our course in, in your week of doing some of our content. But we think this notion of collaborating is really where it's at. Step, particularly for smaller than ours, we want to leverage what we're good at and you know, to pair up to find the budgets.